Hello everybody and welcome back to our lecture series. I am Ted, your host, and for this lecture we're going to continue right along in our discussion on ancient uh, Sumerians and their quest to perfect writing. Now in our last lecture we, uh, we, we tracked the development of the city to make the Sumer. We sort of uh, looked at the dichotomy of the, of the uh, city there in that they could only be supported by intensive agriculture locally and by, the, and by their ability to uh, participate in these long distance uh, trade routes. It would only be with, uh, with, their, with their ability to feed themselves locally by, by creating food surpluses through agriculture and animal husbandry and also uh, their ability to take their uh, available local resources, craft, um, craft uh, trade goods that they could then exchange with other peoples for other uh, vital necessities that they would need to import. Um, hardwoods, uh, other foodstuffs, metals, and semi-precious stones and the likes. Um, it would only be through that and that uh, in order to to organize these, the temples took a, a lead role in sort of organizing the economic life of the cities and that in order to uh, and that the temples were, were forced and the temple scribes were forced to uh, make increasing sophistications into their record keeping into their um into uh into their uh record keeping and their their tally mark system and that sort of led to cuneiform the first form of writing this wedge writing that they did on wet clay and that from cuneiform we began to see the jump into uh pictographs and from pictographs we're going to see the uh the final leap uh, into full-fledged writing, into a, a fully recognizable, a fully, uh, a, a fully, uh, a full-bodied writing system. And that's where we, uh, where we pick up now. Um, and let me just start by saying that one reason that the language and writing system began to advance in Mesopotamia was that two other peoples began to use it in Mesopotamia. The Akkadians, um, uh, from, from Asagarde, in northern Mesopotamia, um, who had also developed commercial city states that were dependent on trade, uh, and, and the Akkadians spoke a Semitic language that was unrelated to Sumerian, and they were applying this writing system that was designed for the mostly monosyllabic agglutinative Sumerian to their inflective Sumerian language, uh, and to the east, the Elamites or the uh, Haltama or the um, Haltamti. Uh, and what is now Iran also began to adopt the writing style of the Sumerians. They were urban, uh, they were traders, and they spoke an Indo-European language. The adoption by two non-Sumerian peoples put pressure on the scribe to start making differentials in what these symbols meant. Um, the fact that that uh, writing was spreading through Mesopotamia and into the uh, Iranian uh, plateau meant that the Sumerian scribes were now confronted with new dilemmas. Uh, they came up with determinatives, and what they uh, and what they were, uh, and what, what they, they came up with a few. Uh, they began to. Um, to indicate that a pictograph meant a simpler grammatical function. Uh, this was the breakthrough that would lead them to, to writing complete sentences sometime around 2600 BCE. Um, and the Sumerian, they, the, the Sumerian scribes, I should say, largely achieved that goal. Uh, many of the writing breakthroughs will be compelled by laziness, I want to say, and the need for convenience. Uh, the medium that they wrote on dictated their writing style. So in the beginning, uh, they they were they were drawing recognizable animals, but slowly they stopped and they drew heads. Uh, then the heads became more abstract, um, represented by a triangle with horns. Um, the process of making their symbols abstract was aided by the Elamites and Akkadians. Who didn't know what the uh, the image originally meant? Uh, they only learnt and applied the abstract markings uh, as it came to them. Now, the earliest documents from Sumeria were written from top to bottom in columns, uh, which can produce uh, errors. 
uh, they changed this around 3000 BCE. They began writing from left to right and horizontally. Uh, the scribe class also began to write um, the pictographs at a 90 degree angle to preserve artistic integrity and continuity. This allowed future tablets to be read the same way uh, as the older tablets by simply rotating the tablets. Uh, they really do line up in a neat column when you look at them. And, and, and they look like the older pictographs. Now the picture quality was rapidly being lost as the writing system becomes more abstract and more simplified. Um, that is the development of writing, a, a major accomplishment for any group and a very important one for future generations is, is really coming into being. The Sumerian writing uh, system will become the progenitor of future writing scripts in the Near East. It is uh, thought to have influenced the development of writing in the Nile and the Indus River Valley, and those again are controversial uh, hot topics. Um, still he, uh, hotly debated by, by scholars uh, and by interested parties. Um, and, and literally, with literacy, everything had changed. Um, the, the big thing, the, the big impact of literacy, and it continues to, uh, to impact us today, and we continue to find that this is true today, is that literacy allows the older generation um, to, for the first time, be capable of handing down information to younger generations. There is no more, uh, if, 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 uh, if, if somebody didn't say it to you, then you don't know it. From now on, you can write down all of your accomplishments, all of your abilities. You, you can write everything down and simply hand it off to future generations. Writing broke down a very ancient barrier of of time allowing uh of time sort of distorting time and uh physical lo uh, locations sort of inhibiting people from picking right up where the last generation left off for the first time generations could simply pick up where their predecessors left off the successors can simply look at and read the accomplishments of their predecessors and know exactly what to do. It's one of the things that, one of the earliest things that we come into to understanding with the class government. Um, the Constitutional Convention comes in and they establish all these patterns. This incoming government, uh, the first government comes in, the first administration comes in and they don't know what to do. So they simply go back and they look and they see what the Constitutional Convention did. And they simply pick right back up and they continue on. And a parallel with United States history is that the, uh, the address to Congress, the, uh, the, the executive address, the presidential address, that was modeled directly off of the British sovereign, the Hanoverian King, going into Parliament and making a speech to Parliament. Washington consciously modeled it off of what King George III did yearly to the British Parliament. We can go back even further and we can look at and we can say um, Philip of Macedon took the Greek style of fighting that he deemed the best style of fighting, that hoplite warfare, and he made advancements upon it. And we will see this later when we, when we examine the career of Philip the, uh, the Philip uh, the second of Macedon. But Philip simply makes his own improvements. He takes the, the Greek hoplite and he adds on to it. He improves it. Uh, and, and that's really uh, one of the, uh, the lessons of writing. That's, you, you, you can just simply pick up um, and, and continue from where, uh, from where you last left off. Now the Sumerians. The Sumerians also developed the earliest known number system. They were uh, they were capable of doing this, um, and they, this, this, they were capable of doing this, and and they were really just revolutionary in this. And because they were doing this for the first time, what they did was they actually created two counting systems. One is a base ten system, and the other is a base six system. And we are naturally inclined to really use 10 because we have 10 fingers, but you can really just use a, uh, um, a number system. You can use a, um, 
any sort of number to base a, a number system off of. Um, for example, when we, when we later look at the Mayans, the Mayans used 20. The Mayans had a base 20 system. Now, the Sumerians, uh, the Sumerians, um, what, what they did was their base 6 system was used for time. And this was a very genius creation. For the Sumerians, um, a, a lot of natural cycles are actually divisible by 6. There are 30 days in a lunar month, and they would have been using... Uh, uh, they would have been tracking uh, everything using a lunar calendar. Uh, a lunar cal calendar wasn't really in uh, existence back then, but they would, they would have been tracking the moon and the appearance of the moon, uh, definitely. And again, the lunar calendar um, had 30 days in it uh, in a lunar month. There are close to 360 days in a year. Uh, and this dual system seems strange and awkward, but it works very well, and it's a bias to the present. We still use it. Um, if you look at it, we count, we do all of our numeral countings, our fiscal countings in, in a base 10 system. We go from 1 to 10. Um, uh, we, and we use, uh, we use the base 6 system for our time. We continue to do that. That's why we have um, the decimal system for math that I just said. But it's also why we use 60 minutes to denote 1 hour or 24 hours to denote 1 day or even why um or even why we count it as uh um 60 seconds in a minute you know it's we, we, we still we still use these uh the the two system the two numeral system from the sumerians um and let me just uh sort of close off on that by saying that the mudflats of mesopotamia proved to be well suited for agriculture which explains why the people stayed and fought for existence their environment placed severe limitations on their cultures, uh, forcing the Mesopotamians to adapt to use their limited resources as best they could, which they really did. Uh, their environments, as we have seen, have had a huge role in determining the size of their states um, and the nature of their gods and how they viewed the world. Uh, they, they were also really convinced that they were in a constant struggle with nature. Okay? And, and as stated earlier, the ancient Sumerians, the ancient Sumer, was a land divided by marches. It was crisscrossed by dikes and canals. By 3000 BC, nearly uh, mo most of the area was nearly all farm cities uh, with outlying manicured fields. Uh, orchards were also, being, were also present at this time. Now, during the development of the cities, uh, of the city-states, all of the marginalized arable land was claimed by one city or another. And pretty soon, their borders began to collide with one another and they began to fight over access to the resources and trade routes. Now, the city-states of Mesopotamia were devoid of natural resources, except for mud and reeds. Uh, they had to import everything, had I stated earlier. These are luxury gems, stone, hardwoods, and metals. By 3000 BC, we have organized warfare for trade routes and, the mar and access to the marginal land. The period after writing is known as the Proto-Dynastic Period. Uh, this was a period of intense and bitter border wars. As noted earlier, uh, Sumer was divided into multiple uh, cities. Chief among them were the cities of Ur, and Ur was the largest. Uh, followed by Larsa and Eridu, um, uh, and, and these are these are some of the major cities, and these, and these would have been port cities once again, port cities on the Persian Gulf. The cities were linked to the Indus River Valley by trade. Further up, there was a Rook, um, another major uh, political center, uh, and really the economic center of of uh, of um, of uh, Sumer. Nippur was the chief uh, religious city in Sumer. Lagash and Umar were rounding out the major cities in central Sumer. And in northern Sumer, there, was, uh, there, were, there were two cities. There were Kish and Barsipur. Kish was an early power in Sumer and represented the northern limit of Sumerian uh, culture, Sumerian civilization. Um, Sumer, uh, or, or the Sumerians, influenced... Uh, uh, peoples beyond their own cultural heartland. Their influence extended into northern Mesopotamia into what was known as Acadia. Uh, as noted earlier, the Acadians came under heavy Sumerian influence. 
they adopted many aspects of a uh, of Sumerian culture. They intermarried, but they were still a bit aloof. Um, they, they they spoke a Semitic language that was unintelligible to the Sumerians. And again, the Sumerian agglutinative language was unintelligible to the Akkadians. Now, to the east of uh, of the Sumerians was Elam, which was centered on the cities of Anshan and Susa. Uh, both cities will recur um, in our lecture series because they will become early, uh, important early Persian uh, urban centers. Now, they adopted aspects, the Elamites, they adopted aspects of Sumerian culture, but they were viewed um, as peoples on the margins of civilizations. The Sumerians are sort of uh, picking and choosing like who is civilized and who isn't. And the Akkadians, uh, they, they found enough common ground with the Akkadians to view the Akkadians as civilized, though not, uh, though, though, though not of the noble land, though, though not of the black-haired people like they were. And the Elamites were sort of these like rough uh, outsiders, these, these, uh, these hill types that you have to keep your eyes on. Um, they, they were viewed as, uh, as, um, as dangerous. They were dangerous peoples, and the Elamites were known to intervene um, in Sumerian affairs. When Sumerian cities went to war with one another over the trade routes, the Elamites would simply appear, sack uh, cities and surrounding countryside areas, and carry off plunder, uh, whether it's trade goods, agricultural goods, or people. Uh, the Elamites would simply show up and, and do what they want and then go off. And to the far north of, uh, of Mesopotamia, the foundations of ancient Assyria were coming together at Asher, the ancient capital, and at Nineveh, another uh, major important uh, Assyrian city. Now, all of these cities were linked together by trade. All of these people were all linked together in this great trade arc. Uh, they, they all began to clap with one another over the trade routes. Now, we're still not sure regarding the organization of these cities, uh, of the Sumerian city-states, but we're fairly confident that they had some form of civic assembly that invested power to rule in a king, which was reflected in their religious tradition. Uh, remember, that uh, their, their holiest site was, um, was where the kingship was lowered from the heavens uh, by the gods to man. Um, now, our sources indicate that from the start, uh, these city-states were theocracies ruled by a small group of families who controlled the religious cults of the, of the city. Uh, the governments appear to have been very tight-knit and very hierarchical. Um, mobilization of the vast amounts of labor needed to run the cities, um, the, the, the labor needed to engage in the trade, to build the ziggurats, to fight border wars, to farm, to raise animals, and to manufacture all the trade goods required, were re required concentrating enormous power into the hands of a small group to, to oversee everything. From 2900 BCE, it became clear that some had to take uh, a leading role in the city leadership, which meant organizing scribes and soldiers. And this was done to create and maintain a standing army and to create a standing bureaucracy to record taxes, uh, weapon, manufacture, uh, weapon manufacturing and weapon storage, and, and also other civic needs, um, uh, uh, all of the other civic needs that are really needed to support uh, an instrument of government, to support uh, a governmental apparatus. Um, around this time, around this time, we begin to encounter men who bear the title NC or NC Gar, a title that will come to mean governor, but which originally was a dynastic title in the Sumerian cities. If a NC of a particular city was able to beat up the NCs of, of its neighboring cities, then that NC would take the title of Lugal. Uh, and Lugal meant little more than big man, but it came to mean king in Sumer. Um, these early wars among the cities helped to speed up the emergence of the NCs. Um, and, and the NCs would begin to emerge as monarchical... Uh, Monarchical figures, uh, the 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 NC, the dynasts would would lay the foundations of monarchical governments. Uh, these positions would become hereditary uh, because they had armies at their backs. Basically, it, it, they became hereditary because of that. Um, the earliest armies in Sumer were made up of what we would call phalanxes, and these are men armed with spears, packed into tight formations with shields, 
uh, chariots, as I, as I stated earlier, um, were, were, were used in, in some of these battles. These Sumerian chariots, uh, as I stated earlier, were made of wood. They were pulled by donkeys or mules. Uh, and they were most likely used to just simply carry the urban elites to the battlefield. They did not have a, an actual function in the battle. They were developing armies that were capable of fighting in heavy shock action. Uh, and this required drill. This required leadership. And most of all, this required training. Uh, the NC, who could provide such leadership, would be in a position to transmit their authority to their families. Uh, those same NC could draw upon the scribe to keep records and cloak them with the outward signs of legitimacy. Now, the wars of the NCs. Uh, the, the, the wars of the NCs were mainly restricted to borders and trade routes. They did not see to combine city-states into larger territorial entities. Um, they, they would make a simple demand for slaves or resources or they may simply just come in and take the local statues of the gods um, of the people and demand to be recognized as a Lugal. Now, these types of battles raged over the landscape of Sumeria with no major political, um, no major political changes until Sargon of Akkad. Sargon, uh, it is reputed, was the son of a flute player who uh, supplanted the king of Kish um, and recruited an army of Akkadians. Uh, Sargon was an ethnic Akkadian himself, uh, although there's um, uh, in, in the records is, there's uh, th there is a record of him being the son of a Sumerian king or at least a Sumerian elite uh, and a uh, Akkadian flute player, but he he appears to have walked the line of being Sumerian and Akkadian. Um, although he more heavily identified with the Akkadian in later years, with the Akkadian part of himself. Um, Sargon supplants the king of Cush, recruits this army of Akkadians, and he begins to conquer the cities of Sumer. Uh, he conquers Uma, he conquers Lagash, he conquers Ur, he conquers Dnieper. Uh, he begins to mobilize the power of Akkad, which... And I, and I have to say that the Sumerians had this very intense localized uh, localization feeling towards being uh, really devoted to their local god or goddess and their local city. The Akkadians did not. Uh, the Akkadians were just, um, they, 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 were, uh, they had a broader sense of unity based on them being Akkadians. And Sargon, uh, Sargon uh, took advantage of the very strong ethnic identity and after his conquest he tore down the walls of every Sumerian city um, before arcing out of Mesopotamia towards the eastern Mediterranean. Uh, he, he goes after uh, literally all of the trade routes. He takes all of the trade routes into his into his hands. Um, he takes various titles to reflect his exalted new position. He is the king of Kish. Uh, he is the NC of Enlil. Uh, the appointed of Ani. Uh, the most important king, uh, the, the most important king or, 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 um, or figure yet seen. Um, and and his, his greatest titles, his two main titles that really sort of cement him is King of Sumer and Akkad. Now, Sargon was the first ruler to use both geographical designations uh, and the first in Mesopotamia to create a territorial state. Uh, and he, he does this after Norman unifies Egypt. Uh, his heirs ruled his empire after him. His grandson even waged wars into Central Asia Minor. Um, the family continued to battle in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, along the shores of the Eastern Mediterranean, and they even go into Iran. Um, and, they, and they add more titles, more, more regal titles. Uh, the title Lord of the Universe, Lord of the Four Corners of the Universe, and Dingar, uh, one who will be deified. Uh, they, they add all these to their titles. Now, the Assyrian kings, uh, not the Assyrian, I'm sorry, the Akkadian kings, I'm sorry about that. Um, the Assyrian kings were effective and their guys had successful warlords because they taxed the cities of Sumer to maintain a standing army. Sargon's army numbered around 5,400 men, which explains his need for the heavy taxation. You have, uh, you know, 5,000 men you have to feed. Um, you, you need to, uh, to make sure that you have the resources available to, uh, to provide for those men. 
Now, in addition to the conquest and taxation, Sargon instituted a royal bureaucracy on a scale never before seen in any of the Mesopotamian city-states. This is a real innovation of one, and an innovation really of the first order, a breakthrough of the first order. Um, Sargon's royal bureaucracy record information in Akkadian to ensure that the taxes are collected. Sargon also devalues the title of Ensi, the old big title that the, that the uh, Sumerian city's uh, leaders uh, fought for. Uh, he devalues it and he appoints Akkadians at the Ensis of various Sumerian cities, um, also cities in Elam and Akkad. Uh, Sargon turns the once dynastic title into a royal administrative official. Ensi will now be synonymous with the term governor. Sargon also embarks on a round of building public uh, of uh, public building works. Um, during his career, he lays out the foundation of future royal rule in Mesopotamia, a strong royal army and a large and efficient royal bureaucracy. Now, the Akkadian Empire lasted about a century before falling uh, to a group of Iranian tribesmen known as the uh, the Gudians. Um, who break through the imperial defenses and sack the Akkadian capital of Asagarde, or 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 Akkad? Um, it's it's both names are are, are uh, appropriate, Asagarde or um, or Akkad. Now Akkad, interestingly enough, and um, had never been um, rediscovered. We don't know where Akkad is. It is lost to us. We don't know if the city was so thoroughly destroyed that the uh, that the Gudians simply destroyed all of the buildings there. We don't know if it was abandoned after the sack. We, we don't know what happened. We don't know if later groups, if the um, Parthians or the Romans or the, the Arabs simply built over that site. We don't know what happened to it. It's lost to us. We, we can, we, we, uh, we're still looking for, for Akkad. And if it's ever found, if it, if it has been abandoned or it's simply swallowed by the desert, when it is found, it will yield... I feel a lot of rich information and material regarding the Akkadians and, and regarding uh, more, uh, giving us a more complete, more detailed view of Sargon himself. Um, as a god is lost, um, the Akkadians never won over the loyalty, and this is an important thing that I want, an uh, important fact I want to make. The Akkadians never won over the loyalty of the Sumerians. Uh, and the Sumerians deeply resented living under these Akkadian emperors, uh, these, these great Akkadian kings. After the sack of Asagade, the Akkadian Empire simply fractures away. Now, the lesson Sargon and his, uh, his family, his, his, uh, his dynasty, taught is absorbed by the, Assyrians, uh, by the uh, Sumerian city-states um, and, and all of the other peoples of the Near East. By 2100 BCE, a Sumerian ruler, um, Ur Namu, and, and Ur Namu with the Lugal of Ur, forges a new empire in the mold of Sargon's empire. He and his son, Shulgi, issue a law code that was intended to be used by Sumer, Akkad, and Elam, the heartland of his domains. The accomplishment here is that for the first time, royal authority is linked to a unified law code. That's what Ernamu and Shogi's uh, major accomplishment is. They they won, they reformed Sargon's empire after uh, it has fallen, after it is fractured, and they institute a law code linking the kingship, royal authority, with this unified law code covering major cities across the wide geographic area and also different geographic de uh, designations. We have, the, we have Elam, Akkad and Sumer, um, all under one legal code. Now, this code survives in fragments. We do not have the complete uh, body of laws. And Shulgi's reign, uh, to, to focus on Shulgi a bit, Shulgi's reign also witnesses cuneiform become a concise, legal, and administrative language, and an important literary revival occurs. During Shulgi's reign, the ancient Sumerian myths uh, all, all of their founding myths, all, all of those ideas that were um, orally passed down are finally written down uh, some eight to seven hundred years after Sumerian uh, literacy first emerges. 
um, a, a, another great accomplishment for, for any king, for any monarch. In his reign, the ancient uh, Sumerian rift are written now. The Sumerian Empire only lasts for a century. It falls apart just like the Akkadian Empire. And it falls because the Elamites, those, you know, those dangerous hill type folks, they come in and they invade and they sack Ur. And they break the power of Ur and they disorganize the royal administration. It is at this point that we will break and we'll come back in with a new group, the, 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 uh, the new group, the, the next uh, group of people who will come in and sort of refocus, reorganize Mesopotamia. As always, I am Ted. Hit like, subscribe, and comment. Let me know what you thought about this lecture. Let me know what you thought about these accomplishments. And I will see you guys next time for another lecture.